we're going to cover today. The first thing we need to do is describe what sort of things can happen to an RNA molecule once it's made. So if you remember from last time, our RNA polymerase reads the template strand of the DNA. The coding strand is not used. So we read the template strand, and across from each base, we put in the corresponding paired base of RNA. It's assembled into a long polymer. It continues until some point we're told to stop, either by a, a row-dependent mechanism or a row-independent mechanism. And that RNA then needs to be processed in eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, as this was being made, it is essentially immediately used by a ribosome if it's mRNA. In eukaryotes, however, the ribosomes are precluded from entering the nucleus, so we have time and space to process our RNA before it's exported into the cytoplasm. So what sort of things can we do to the RNA? We'll have four things listed here, and we're going to do various degrees of these things to each of the RNA transcripts, depending on what type it is. So the first thing listed is the leader and trailer sequences are removed, or essentially trimmed away. This is an exonuclease function. So either the 5' end, which is called the leader end, or the 3' end of the RNA molecule, called the trailing sequence, or the trailer end, can be removed one base at a time. Okay, and that, of course, make the molecule shorter. We can do one or both of those things, and depending on which RNA we're talking about, we'll apply some of those things. The opposite thing we can do, either before or after that, is add bases back. But we can only add bases to the 3' end, okay, in the normal sense. So nucleic acids can only be synthesized 5' to 3'. Prime, so we can only add on to the 3' end. We can add 1, 2, a dozen, 200, whatever bases we like to the 3' end. So not quite base addition, but more base modification, as number 3 here, we can put a base on the 5' end, however, we can only put one. And we're not putting it on in the normal manner. We're going to take that new base and put it on backwards so that it looks like the sequence has no 5' end by the time we're done with it. And we'll see how that works in, in a few minutes. Okay. We also can modify the base. We can add methyl groups. We can add acetate groups. We can rearrange some bonds. We can do all sorts of things to the bases, to the sugars as well. And we'll look at some of those base modifications. And the last of the four categories here, I'm going to call splicing. And to be called splicing, you can't just cut off a base. Okay, that's number one. That's just trimming, exonuclease activity. So to do splicing, you have to do two parts. This is going back to when you were in, in kindergarten or grade school, when you were asked to cut and paste. Okay, so if you just cut the D DNA or RNA or any nucleic acid, that's simply a cleavage event. It's not splicing. If you just assemble two pieces of nucleic acid, again, not splicing, you must cut and paste. So we must cut a piece of nucleic acid, remove a piece of it, and then put the remaining pieces back together. So it must be spliced or linked back together. So there must be a hydrolysis and a ligation. So cut and paste. Okay, and we'll see what level of each of these is applied to our tRNAs and mRNAs and rRNAs as we go through this. And what are the, the benefits of knowing this? What can we use this for? Well, one feature is to treat certain illnesses or to identify the cause of certain illnesses. So the, the madness of King George picture there, um, part of it was he truly was losing his mind, but part of it also was the fact that he had some errors in his metabolism of heme groups. So the breakdown of heme groups after they're, they're used in the red blood cells, and you, you used to, you're supposed to break them down completely into bilirubin and biliverdin and so forth, and eventually you excrete them in your urine. Well, if you're missing one of the enzymes in that pathway, you can't completely degrade those molecules, and they get stuck at some intermediate along the way, and the urine may look blue or, or brown or some other color, and those intermediates may not get pass through the urine, they may just accumulate somewhere in the body and that can cause pain and neurological disorders and things like that. So that may have been one of the causes of the madness of King George, King George III. And in the end, we'll look at exactly what was wrong with his heme metabolism. It's called a, a protein was missing. I'm not going to point out which one because we're not quite sure which one it was. 
but there were, it's common in the, the monarchies of the time, because they were inbred quite bit, a bit, that they had the same gene passed on from, from parents to children. So he had a problem with degrading one of his, his metabolites of hemoglobin, or heme, and he couldn't metabolize it completely, and he had these buildup of intermediate molecules causing him pain, illness, and neurological problems. Okay. So let's start with the, the biggest of the RNA molecules. That's going to be our rRNA, ribosomal RNA. And let's step back and see how it was made. Remember, rRNA was made by RNA polymerase 1, right? And it was made as one continuous strand, which is several thousand bases long. And within that strand are going to occur the sequences that will become, at some point, our, our RNAs that make up the ribosome. In the picture at the top, we're going to look at the eukaryotic version. So we have 18S, 5.8S, and 28S. Those three pieces will become the large and small subunits of the ribosome once they're completely processed, exported to the new or exported to the cytoplasm, and fold up amongst themselves, as much as including many modifications along the way. So in the beginning, though, it's made as one long stretch. You notice there's some amber color pieces here and some blue colored useful pieces. We need to remove all those other pieces. But this is not splicing. Okay? I'm going to cut those pieces out of the context of a longer piece of RNA, but I am not splicing them back together. I'm not pasting them back together. Now it is true that they will eventually fold up and reassemble, but they're not going to become a single strand again. Right? They're just associating with each other as the ribosome. So this is not splicing. So we'll take the top piece as it's made from RNA polymerase 1, and it's going to get modified. And two main modifications we're going to do to it is, one, we're going to methylate it. We're going to stick methyl groups all over the place, not on every base, but it's the, the concentration of methyl groups that matters. So many bases will get methylated. A methyl group will be put on by a methyl transferase. It's going to put methyl groups on a lot of the bases and several of the sugars in the regions that are going to correspond to the functional parts of this message, the 18S, the 5.8S, S. the parts that we want to survive will get methylated. Additionally, some of the uracils in there will get flipped around into something we call pseudouridine. And I'll put a picture at the bottom of the page for you to show you what that means. On the bottom left, you have our normal uridine base, the uracil attached to the ribose on this RNA. And it's attached to carbon 1, or 1 prime, of the ribose through its nitrogen in the ring. If we were to flip the uridine around, the uracil around, so that instead of being attached through its nitrogen, it's attached through the carbon, so it's a 180 degree flip there. And this is done by an enzyme called pseudouridine synthase, or PUS. It's now attached through its carbon, and a couple consequences from that. Number one, the nitrogen that was attached now has hydrogen on it, it did not before. So it's an additional hydrogen bonding amine group. That's a possibility, which it wasn't there before, it was just a carbon. And because it's now a carbon-carbon bond instead of a carbon-nitrogen bond to the sugar, it gives me more rotational freedom and more conformational flexibility. In other words, this thing can have more range of motion than it had before when it was just uridine. Now it's pseudouridine. And the last consequence of this is when it does continue to make a, a base pair to an A, which is perfectly fine because the uracil was symmetrical about this rotation on that side. When it makes the bonds to the A, it's really no different, but I'm able to make the hydrogen bonding to an A in a slightly different bend or orientation, which improves my base stacking. So they can still stack on the bases above and below it with this conformation rather than it was before. So I have a lot more freedom of movement, of bending, of stacking, of forming arrangements within this RNA strand than I didn't have before. And that's what my pseudouridines will do. Not all uracils are turned to, to pseudouridines, just a few of them are. Um, the, the proportion of these could be anywhere from 0.2% you know, of them up to 4% of them in some of our tRNAs. So in the rRNAs, we do put a few of them, but not very many. Okay? But the idea here is because of the modifications, the methyl groups and these pseudouridines, we're now protecting that segment of RNA from being degraded. Okay, so we have some RNases or ribonucleases come along, and wherever they have access, they will cleave the strand. So these methyl groups and the modifications made to pseudouridine and so forth protect these regions from getting cleaved. 
So all those amber regions at the top, which are white regions in the second version of the picture, get chewed apart. Right? And our pieces that survive are the three rRNAs that will eventually get modified again. We're going to remove some of those methyl groups, we'll modify it some more, other enzymes, export them out of the nuclear pores, and then they can fold up in the cytoplasm. Uh, Dr. Meats, I had a quick question. Go ahead. On the the uh, uracil, when it flips and the pi bond is attached to like the hydrogen, where does that hydrogen for the nitrogen come from? On the that? top. The, the proton or the nitrogen could be donated from water or ammonia or whatever else might be around, usually a water molecule or some amino oh, acid okay. in the protein. So it's just uh, another thing floating around allowing it to get attached. Yeah, so it's generally going to be a, a, a nucleic acid, not nucleic acid, but a, a amino acid in part of the, the PUS protein that could donate the proton, or it could just pick it up from solvent if the solvent's accessible. Okay, thank you. The, the difficult part about this is actually reconnecting the carbon-carbon bond, not so much the protons. Okay, so we won't get into too much of the, the mechanism of that. We would do that if you were taking the, the 3501 class. But in here, we just want to make, make you aware that this is just a flip around, 100 degree, 180 degree rotation. And how it's newly attached gives it some new abilities and some freedoms. And so to review the rRNA, we simply protect regions of it with methyl groups and other modifications such as pseudouridines. The RNases, ribonucleases, come along and chew up whatever is accessible to them. So that would be the non-modified regions, the non-heavily modified regions. And what's left is three independent pieces that can fold up on their own after they exit the nucleus. And this is the ribosome, right? This is the RNA component of the ribosome. The 28S and the 5.8S will go on to make the large subunit. And the 18S will fold along with some proteins and make the small subunit, which we'll talk about those on our next our next lecture on Thursday. Okay. So moving on to tRNAs, so these are much smaller. So the rRNAs was thousands of bases long and it gets chewed up into smaller multi-hundred to thousand base pair regions. So here this sequence is only about 70, 80, 90, up to 100 or so bases long, so fairly short. Okay. So the example shown on the screen here is for a, a tRNA tyrosine. Um, there's roughly 20 of these in the cell and they all have slightly different sequences but they have overall the same general shape now what's shown here is your typical on the right is your typical clover leaf drawing which is not how it looks in the cell okay this is the the, the roadkill version of this diagram as if the, the tRNA got run over by a truck or a steamroller and this is what it would look like if you flattened it out but it really doesn't look like this you know when two strands of nucleic acid bind together, such as in these stems here, like you see at the top part, on the side here and the bottom, when the stems bind to each other, they form a double helix. So this thing will twist around itself. And that's better shown over here on the right, where you have in yellow here is the tRNA, right? You notice the bottom stem twists around itself, as does the side stem. And that's showing this bottom piece here, and this side piece up here. The side pieces of this cloverleaf drawing, the D loop and the T psi C loop, aren't nearly as long as the top and bottom piece, so they don't twist around as much. Okay, so you know when it twists around, you take so many bases to turn, and these aren't that long, they don't turn a full turn around. Okay, but before we get to this mature tRNA and its L-shaped reality form, or the cloverleaf drawing here, it starts out life a little longer in eukaryotes. So the picture on the left is the, the piece of RNA they came out of the, the ribosome, or sorry, not ribosome, came out of the RNA polymerase, and RNA polymerase type three is the main one that will make this, right? It makes all of your tRNAs except for one, which was made by RNA polymerase one, but we'll talk about the bulk of them made by RNA polymerase three, and you see it's got some things to it. And in fact, of all the things we could do to RNA, all those processing types we mentioned on the first slide, all five of them are done here. Right, well, four types, but all of them are done here. Okay? So in the beginning here, I tried to color code the text at the bottom with the colors and the figures, and I have a little analogy for this I'll explain next time when we do the lecture on translation. But at the top here, the first thing we're going to do is cut off all the bases we can on the 5' prime end. So when the RNA is made, it folds up on itself. You notice we form a bunch of stem loops and pairings, but some of the bases are still single-stranded, right? They're unpaired. 
So at the very beginning, we have this stretch of, of green bases here, and an RNA polymerase, or sorry, an RNA will come along and cleave off all these bases one at a time until it can't reach anymore. The enzyme that does this, that cleaves off the five prime leader sequence here, is called RNase P. And in fact, it's not a protein at all. It's an enzyme made entirely of RNA. Right? So RNA can act as an enzyme, much like the ribosome does. This is a much smaller enzyme. It's called a ribozyme because it's made entirely of RNA. And this part of the picture over here, in yellow again, was my tRNA, or the pre-tRNA bound to it. And the other parts of it are again made only of RNA, right, right here, and it cleaves this piece. Now there is shown here an accessory protein, right, that can cleave the other side, shown in blue there, but I'm only talking about the RNase P at the moment. So the RNase P can bind to this thing and cleave off all those green bases until it cuts off that last A. We can't cut the C off, not so much because it's base paired, but because the enzyme, the RNase P, can't reach the next bond. It can't reach the Cu phosphodiester bond okay, because of the base pairing. So it can't reach it. So we'll cleave off everything up to that C. So all those ones in green are cleaved off one at a time until it can't reach the next one. Okay. On the other end of the molecule, the three prime end, we have a similar process going on. It's not RNase P this time. It's called tRNase. Okay, this one is actually a protein, not a piece of RNA. And shown in the picture is the little light blue thing. Uh, so it cuts off the little UU you see at the three prime end of this thing, right? If there were more bases, it would cut them off as well. But it cuts off the UU, okay, down to the A. Now, why can't it cut the A off? Again, don't think it's because the A is base paired. In fact, it's not. It's because it can't reach the other bond. It can't reach the next AG or GA bond there, okay? If it can't reach it, it can't cut it. Now remember, this one's reaching it from the other side. It's a slightly different enzyme, so the pocket looks different, and it can't reach as far as, say, RNase-P can. Right? So when I'm done, there is a staggered end. Right? So these U's are removed from the three prime end. All the green ones are removed from the five prime end. I still have my stem here, but there's an A protruding from the three prime end. So it has a three prime overhang on the end of it. Okay? The next thing we can do, and this must be done in this order, obviously, is I can add some bases back to the three prime end. I can't add too many to the five prime end, in fact, none here, because you only add to the three prime end of nucleic acids. You can only synthesize five to three. But I have an enzyme that will come in. It's called the CCA adding enzyme, and it puts on three bases, C, C, and A. And the colors don't quite match here. I could have done this in a darker or orange to match the color in the figure. I just happened to do it in the pink but it's adding CCA back to the end of the molecule, okay? And it always adds exactly CCA, okay? In prokaryotes, this doesn't happen. These three steps don't happen in prokaryotes, okay? So when a prokaryotic tRNA is made, the ends already look like they're supposed to. It has a CCA at the end when it was newly synthesized. So they don't do this type of mechanism. Only eukaryotes do this. They trim the five prime end, they trim the three prime end, and then we put on CCA at the end. Not ACC, not CAC, not any other combination, CCA every time. Doesn't sound so impressive. Here's the impressive part. It puts the CCA on without any direction whatsoever. There is no template. You notice the other side, there's no pairing. There's nothing to read. So there's nothing instructing it to put C on. There isn't a G on the other side telling it to do it. There isn't another G, and there isn't a U or a T next to the A at all. It does this without instruction, which is quite amazing. All right, so it's one of two enzymes we found that do not require a template. Okay, so this is a, a polymerase, an RNA polymerase, that can put on bases without direction from a template. How it does it, there's a paper you can go read. It's called the uh, story with a good ending, right, by Tom Stites. It explains how the CCA is added to the end of it. And it's quite amazing how it does it, based on size and polarity of the hydrogen bonding partners. But as far as I want you to remember for this class, it puts on CCA every time, no other sequence, and it does so without the use of a template. Now, of course, it does it adding on to a sequence already, but as you know, RNA polymerases don't require primers. So this thing would not need a primer per se, but it does act by adding on to the end already. So 
Asking whether or not it needs a primer is kind of a silly question. Okay. So once we've put those on, we've cut off the five and three prime ends, done some trimming, we put the CCA back on, and then we start modifying some bases. One of the modifications is that pseudouridine that's listed as the psi in here. So as our uracil has been flipped around, attached through its carbon instead of nitrogen, that's the psi you see in many places in this protein, or in this uh, tRNA. We also can put some methylation events, and we generally methylate guanines and cytosines. Right? But you can methylate other things. So here in the corner of the, the D loop, you see we have a methyl guanine. Here's another methyl guanine. And opposite that, we have a methyl cytosine. Right? So we put lots of methyl groups, and we make some pseudouridines and several other modifications that you don't want you to memorize all of them. But these all, all these modifications are required so that the thing can fold properly. If one of these is not done, it will not adopt the correct shape. Okay, so all these are important. Once all of those modifications are made and it adopts the right shape, then a protein can come along and say, you look like almost mature tRNA. I'll go ahead and fix your anticodon loop. So at the end at the bottom, you notice a piece is cut out here in blue, right? This blue piece at the bottom is removed, and then the remaining pieces are put back together. That sounds like splicing. So I removed a piece of the RNA and I put the remaining pieces back together. That's the definition of splicing. So we did everything to this molecule. We did some trimming on both ends. We added some bases back. We modified some bases, modified some of the sugars as well. And then we removed one intron. Okay? And anytime you remove something and splice it back together, it's called an intron. But it's not part of mRNA here. This is tRNA. Okay, so we remove exactly one intron so that the mature loop here, the anticodon loop, is complete. At that point, our tRNA is ready for its next step, which I'll save for our lecture on Thursday on translation, but it's ready to receive its amino acid. Okay, we'll save that for translation on Thursday. So tRNA is extensively processed here, right, and it has all these parts. And lastly, we have our mRNA, which is intermediate in size between our very large rRNAs and our very small tRNAs. But mRNA, made as it comes out the back of the RNA polymerase, type 2, right, has some modifications as well. Okay, so these are ways to protect our mRNA so that it doesn't last just a very brief moment in the cytoplasm, and it doesn't protect it indefinitely as well, but it extends the life of the mRNA in the cytoplasm. So one of the things we can do to it is not quite a lie to building nucleic acids, but not entirely following the rules. So what we can do is take a guanine, right? So a guanosine, which is guanine on the ribose plus the phosphate, and turn it around backwards and attach it to the five prime end. So we're gonna make the attachment five prime to five prime, right? So showing the picture over here on the right, What's in black is base number one, base number two, and then base number three is off the screen. You don't see it at the bottom. So these were the first three bases of the RNA. And if you remember from last time, I told you when RNA was made, at the very five prime end of it, there were still three phosphates. So if you can imagine the, the thing on the right here, ignore everything in red, pretend it's not there, and we had three black phosphates at the beginning of this molecule. So one, two, three. If these were all three black, that would be our nascent or newly born RNA. What comes along is a guanosine here in red, also with three phosphates. They're not all shown because this is the finished product, but imagine a red guanosine up here with one, two, three phosphates as well. Okay? And those two come together and you lose a phosphate from one and you lose a pyrophosphate from another. So imagine the RNA that's newly synthesized loses one black phosphate, and then the incoming GTP, right, or methylated GTP, we'll get to the methyl group in a second, but it's a GTP command, loses its latter two phosphates, the beta and gamma phosphates, as pyrophosphate, which you know get degraded by pyrophosphatase to drive this forward, and then I'm left with three phosphates being attached, one from the GTP, which is now GMP, and two of the three that started out on the end, five prime end of the nascent tRNA, or in this case, mRNA. So I have three phosphates bridging two five prime carbons. So it's kind of like you put the first one on backwards. That methyl group I mentioned, so the, the guanine that I just added 
has been methylated. Okay, so we call that cap zero because this is the first base down here in black. So I put on a base ahead of the first base. So I guess we should call that base zero. Okay? Uh, if we didn't have our concept of zero, we'd call it base minus one, and that's often done when you're looking at nucleic acids as well. So this base gets a methyl group. We're going to call that cap zero. The next base on the sugar, you notice I methylated the two prime hydroxy, right? That could not occur in DNA because it does not have a two prime hydroxy. And on base number two down here, its ribose sugar is also methylated. One or more of these methylation events could occur. In fact, all of them could occur. The more methylated it is, the more stable the molecule is going to be to degradation. Okay, so we can methylate the, the guanine. It's generally methylated. And then we put it on the five prime end backwards to protect this end. We methylate base one, perhaps base two, perhaps base one or two. And then we could also methylate farther down the chain if we'd like. Okay, this cannot be done to DNA because it doesn't have that two prime hydroxy. Okay. Farther down the chain, at the very end, when we put on these hundreds to thousands of bases, and at the very end, it has a three prime OH as well. But that's susceptible to hydrolysis as well. So we need to protect it. And you've probably heard of this protection. At the very end, we put on a couple of hundred A's, right? We put on a poly A tail. What's the point of the tail? If it starts getting degraded, I could lose, say I put on 200 A's, I could lose 150 A's, and I have not lost any useful information from this message. It could still do the, the synthesis of a protein, or still direct the synthesis of a complete protein. However, it starts getting degraded farther back. If I go beyond the A's and into the useful data, then this mRNA could not serve to make that protein anymore. And eventually that's what happens. Right? But putting the poly A tail on extends its life that it can be used as a message to direct that protein synthesis. Okay? Along the way, we do one other thing in the middle of there, not at the 5' prime end and not at the 3' prime poly A tail, but in the middle, most eukaryotic genes, there are some exceptions, but most eukaryotic genes remove one or more introns, putting the exons back together. So we're going to do splicing here as well. Right? So let's go through each of those last processes and see what's going on. So here's our, our template DNA in blue and red again, just like the previous uh, lecture's pictures. The blue serving as our template strand, the red serving as the uh, coding strand, which is not used. I'm not sure if that's the same orientation as before, but in this picture, the blue is definitely the template strand. The green is our nascent RNA, our newly born RNA. As it's coming out, it gets its five prime cap. It may get the cap one, cap two put on as well, depending on if the enzyme recognizes it. And in the very end, when we find us, finally stop making this RNA, whether by it's row independent or row dependent, there's going to be a, a sequence in here, this AAU, AAA, that some specific RNAs, a nuclease, will come and cleave. Okay? It comes in and just cuts this piece off. It recognizes the sequence. Of course, the, if this was, let's perhaps say this was row independent, near the end of this would be that stem loop followed by some U's, which may or may not get put on depending how much it stalls. If this is farther back from that. This is earlier than that. So the U's would be at the very tail of this green thing. So this is farther back. It could be 100 bases upstream of that. It could be 20 bases upstream of that. So it varies. But it's going to look for the sequence of AAUAAA. And it's going to cleave it off. Okay. Once we cleave off all the, the mess after that, the next enzyme to show up will be the one that puts on all these A's. You know, 100, 200, 300 A's, whatever it is. And it's got a great name. It's called poly A polymerase, right? It's kind of a, a very rudimentary enzyme in that it knows to put A on because A is the only base that fits in its active site, the ATP. So it just puts on A's over and over and over, right? It's as if the enzyme had one, a keyboard with one key that said A, and that's all it puts on. It's pretty easy to keep mashing the keyboard. So this is the second of our two enzymes that does not require a template. Remember we had the CCA adding enzyme? It did that without a template, and that was quite amazing. It knew to put C and then C and then change to A and then stop without direction. Here, this also has no direction, but it's a one key keyboard. All it knows to do is put on A. And it doesn't put on any particular number. It just puts a boatload of them on, and at some point stops. It falls off. Okay? Some put more than others, depending on the sequence. But it just puts on a bunch of A's. And that's not so hard to imagine that that doesn't need instructions. It's the only base that fits. 
whereas the CCA is a little more difficult to understand how it works without instruction. Okay, so the more A's that are put on the, the end of this, the longer this mRNA will persist in the cytoplasm to be used to direct a protein synthesis. So if it only gets a few A's, the half-life of this mRNA is much shorter. Okay. All right, now we get into the splicing. So this part's going to is several slides on this, and I'm going to show it to you uh, six different ways. Hopefully one of these images or depictions or graphs or schemes or videos, whatever you want to call them, one of them will make sense to you. Now, every one of these ways of describing it or drawing it sort of features one aspect of it and does it well, but it leaves out all the other features. And if you try to put it all in one figure, it just gets cluttered and confusing. So I'm going to use each figure here to kind of describe what's happening. And you can imagine putting all these depictions together to see the overall process. And there's going to be a video I've linked to help you see that. Okay, so let's start from the beginning at the top right here. We have a piece of mRNA, right? It's going to get a 5' prime cap. It might get cap 1, cap 2. And it's going to get a 3' prime poly A tail at some point. What we're going to focus on is the middle part of it. Nowhere near the ends, but in the middle. So we have some introns and exons here. So exons are going to be represented in the, the blue color in this picture, and the introns in the more orangish color. Okay? So underneath, it's shown we put a cap on, we put a poly A tail on, and we need to remove all these introns. So we need to loop them out, cut it twice, and put the blue pieces back together. Okay? It's not exactly how it happens, because that would be a terrible way to do it. But you have to cut those out and put the blue pieces back together. And then you notice all the exons, in this case showing three in the picture, are put together, and I've removed two introns. Okay, so a quick little math question. If you have a mRNA that has 28 exons in it, how many introns would it have? There are 28 exons. How many introns does it necessarily have? Fourteen. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Fourteen. Not fourteen. All right. Let me let me make the, make it a simpler problem. If there were only two exons, how many introns would it have? One. One. The intervening piece, right? If I had three exons, as shown in the picture on the slide, there's two introns. If I go up to four exons, there must be a, an intron between every exon. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a separate exon, right? So if I had 28 exons, how many introns would there be? 27. 27. 27. It's, it's exactly right. Always one fewer because it separates all of them. And of course, it begins and ends with an exon, so there's always one more exon than there are introns. Does that mean all those introns are always removed and all the exons put back together? No. Sometimes we'll skip an entire exon and not include it in the final product. Sometimes we'll skip several of them. Right? So this, it's another flexibility and, and diversity of our splicing ability. But from the point of view of just the, the architecture, there's always one more exon than there are introns, or there's always one fewer intron than there are exons. Okay? We'll do a simple example where we're just going to remove one intron to show you how it's done. So on the bottom left of this figure, and I apologize for the color changes, maybe I'll change these in the future to match the blue and orange there, but it's labeled for you. So we from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end, you see the, the darker blue or purple exon number one, and then the same color exon number two. Between the two is the lighter color purple, is the intron, okay? and it begins with the sequence G, U, and then there's some more bases, and at some point in the middle there's some A that I've labeled. The sizes of these strands aren't relative, and then eventually the intron ends with the sequence A, G, and then we begin exon number two. Okay? So I've accounted for everything in the figure except for some little stretch of RNA between the two, and that's not part of the mRNA. That's a splicing partner, a splicing helper, right? So if you look at it, you notice there's quite a few U's in it. This is not the entire sequence. This is just a small segment of it. But if you look at it, there's quite a few U's. In fact, there's quite a few C's as well. But the, if you looked at the entire sequence, which we'll do later, there's a predominantly U-rich uh, piece of RNA here, right? 
So these are small nuclear RNAs. This is one of them. This happens to be U6, right? So we call them small nuclear RNAs or SN RNAs, or in the shorthand, we just call them U's because they contain a lot of U's, right? So there's U1, there's U2, there's U6, there's U5, so forth. So these get numbers with their names. So if we look call small nuclear RNA1, we could just simply call it U1, right? It's a shorthand for it. So what does it look like U6 here is actually doing with this mRNA folding up on itself? So what does it appear that U6 is actually doing? Base pairing. Say again? Base pairing. It, it is base pairing. What parts of it? The U6 is base pairing with what? The intron. Okay, so it's it's got a part of it that's base pairing with the beginning of the intron, the GU, and it's got a part of it that's base pairing with the end of the intron, the U, U, I mean the uh, AG, which is base paired by the UC. It's also doing one other thing. It's kind of an unusual base pair. What else is happening in this picture? It's an unusual base pair. There's a GA. GA. Right, so it looks like there's a GA pair going on, but wait a minute, the G is pairing with the C, so it can't be pairing with the A. Well, not in the traditional Watson Crick sense. So the G is pairing with C, that's absolutely right. But A's, adenines, have a, a tendency to base pair to the back of other base pairs. It's kind of like a, a third wheel, right? So if, if the GC is paired there, on the back side of the G is room for the A to base pair with it, right? It's not really a, a Watson Crick pairing at all, but it, it's enough so that it sticks there. Okay? And we'll see how that's useful when we get to the splicing parts in a second. That's not an, that's not an example of like a wobble base, is it? It's not an example of wobble base pairing, no. Um, that's going to be when we do translation of mRNA to tRNA with the codon anticodon. Okay, so this is not wobble pairing, this is a kind of a, a, a backside binding to a base pair that's already there. Okay, this is also useful in translation, we'll see how that works later too. Okay. So here's a better diagram at the top, and I'm going to show you quite a few of these pictures and videos and images and such, and one of them or each of them is usually good at showing one thing well and the rest it kind of fails at showing well. So at the top here we have our linear description of the exon, intron, exon arrangement again. So here exon 1 is in blue, exon number 2 in green, and the intervening uh, intron is in the, the red color text. So the beginning of the intron is always a GU, and the end of the intron, we're reading it left to right, 5 to 3, is an AG. Okay. And almost always, the last basis of the exon is usually an A, sometimes a G, but usually a purine followed by a G. Here it shows AG. And the first base of the next exon is almost always a G. Okay. So we're going to split the two GG boundaries. Right? So we have a G followed by a GU at the beginning. And then we have an AG followed by a G at the end. And we're going to split the Gs every time, if that helps you remember it. Right? So in order to do this, I need some other players. Right? The, the mRNA won't splice itself, at least not in this scenario. And we need to add some new players. So these are going to be our small nuclear RNAs. Right? And I said we're going to call them U, so U1, U2, etc. And we're only going to talk about five of them. Right? There are more. We're going to simplify our talk to just five of them, the, the five basic ones. And they're called U1, U2, U4, U5, and U6, right? There is no U3. Why is there no U3? I know that's, that makes no sense. Why isn't there a U3? Well, this is a consequence of science. And you discover and describe something and publish it, you get to name it. And so the first ones were discovered, and they called them U1 and U2. That makes a lot of sense because they were U-rich small nuclear RNAs, and we didn't want to write SNRNA over and over and over, so they called it U1. Someone discovered said, hey, I found another one, let's call it U2. And then someone found another, and they called it U3. And you continue following that convention all the way to U4, U5, and U6. And what happens often in, in science, since you know people aren't truly competing, but 
they may be working on something and totally ignorant that another group is also working on that same thing, right? And it turns out the people who were discovering U3 were publishing it and went, wait, that's already been named. That was U2. Someone already figured that one out. We can't keep calling it U3 now. It's confusing. So it just got the name U2. But by then, they'd already named U4, U5, and U6, and there's no point in changing them. Okay? So that's why they have the names they do. All right? Same thing happened with our vitamins. We'll, we'll talk about those too. Right, so we have U1 and U2, and it's a nice split because those happen independently of what happens with U4, 5, and 6, so it's convenient. Okay, so the first thing that happens, if you look at the picture, and if you watch that YouTube video on the bottom right, I put a link for it there in your slides, it's a, like a, a few-minute video that shows this in animation. Also, the one on the left shows RNA splicing in the hole in animation, so hopefully those videos will fill in the gaps of what these still pictures can't show you. But let's talk about how it's assembled. So we have our miniature version of what's at the top. You see it in, in blue and green there with our exon, intron, exon. And then there was this A at the top in the middle. It's the same A that was doing that weird pairing we said on the previous slide. And it's called the branch site A, or, or the interintron or intraintron A, which is a crazy name for it. But it occurs near the three prime end of the intron. It's not at the end and it's not in the middle, but it's towards the three prime end, just a, a few dozen bases from the end, all right, from that AG end. Okay, how do we know which A? Because there's a lot of A's in there. Well, it's the one that's, it precedes a, quite a few pyrimidines, mostly U's. It's a UC rich region, but mostly U's. There's an A right before it, and that's the one that's recognized. So there clearly must be some way of recognizing that. So if you were designing this, you were given options of, I need you to design a molecule that can recognize this A, this branch site A, in the context of the other bases around it. What would be the ideal machinery to do that? Your choices are, you could design a protein that recognizes a sequence. We know those exist. They work very well for recognizing DNA and other RNAs. Or would you want to use a piece of RNA to recognize it? Well, the piece of RNA seems the better choice because it can base pair with the region of interest. I can find it exactly and precisely. So that's what happens. The piece that recognizes this A, right, is called U2. And then the piece of RNA, again, in the same manner, that recognizes the five prime starting site or the splice site up there, the GU at the beginning, is called U1. So there are pieces of RNA. Now, of course, they have little proteins that go along with them to help them do their jobs and make it more efficient. But all the functional parts are done by the RNA, much like the ribosome. Why did you say the U1 represented? So U, or recognizes? U1 recognizes the five prime spl splice site, the beginning of the intron, that GU. And U2 recognizes the internal A, right, the branch site A. It does not recognize the three prime splice site. It recognizes the branch site A. Okay, so U1 finds the five prime end of the intron, and U2 independently finds the branch site A. And those are RNA molecules. U1 and U2, they're pieces of RNA that are ideally suited to finding these sites because they can base pair with them. Okay, so those two events happen independently of one another. U1 finds its site, and U2 finds its site. But these are the first two events that must happen. Right? After this, the U4, U5, U6 complex shows up as a whole. U4, it's not shown in this figure. It's listed it's in text, but it doesn't show how that was assembled. And we'll get to that in a minute. But the U4, 5, 6 complex shows up as a group and binds to U1 and U2. Uh, a silly analogy I like to help remember this, and it doesn't really look like this, but it helps you visualize it. If you think of U1 and U2 as donut holes, you know, the little piece that gets cut out, and you can fry it up, it's a little sphere of dough. Think of those little donut holes. Think of U4, 5, and 6 as a group showing up as a traditional donut with a hole in it. Okay? U1 and U2 fit snugly on each side of the donut, right? They're bigger than the hole, so they don't quite go in all the way. But you can see in this figure in the center, it's like two donut holes approaching the edges of a donut or the sides of a donut. U1 and U2 do not make contact with each other there, but they're on each side of the donut, whereas 4, 5, 6 is the traditional, you know, torus-shaped donut. 
Does that hopefully make sense on how this is visualized, how to put together? So U1 and U2 have bound to their respective sites. U4, 5, and 6 show up as a complex. U1 binds on one side, U2 binds on the other side. Now, they're still holding this piece of mRNA between them. U2 is still holding that A, and U1 is still holding the GU 5' end. At this point, we have some rearrangement. U1 gives the 5' end to U5. Right? U5 says, I'll take that, I can hold it. Right? U6 participates in that as well, but mainly hands it to, to U5. Right? So U1 then leaves. Right? U4 has been base paired to U6 this entire time. Right? U4 is complementary to U6, so it's covering up U6. So when this all comes together and U1 leaves, U4 also leaves, exposing U6 as a linear piece of DNA, right? a single-stranded linear piece. So think of U4 as a lens cap, right? We're going to keep U6 covered until we're ready to use it, right? We don't want it exposed or anything. So U1 and U2 clamp onto each side of the 4, 5, 6 donut. U1 gives its 5 prime end to U5. That kind of makes it easy to remember. And then U1 leaves. U4 detaches from U6 and leaves. And on U6 is where everything lines up. And that's what I showed that picture earlier on. Right, you remember the picture back here where we had the first part and the latter part of the intron lining up with some other molecule. This is the scaffolding that is U6. Okay? It didn't have access to it before because U4 was covering it up. But now that U4 is gone, the lens cap has been removed, the 5 prime end and the 3 prime end and that A can all line up on this scaffolding or this platform called U6. Okay? So that's where we are at the bottom picture here. Okay? So what I've done now is I took this bottom picture and just redrew it at the top up here a little bigger so you can see it, right? This big black arrow is just moving it up here for you. And we're going to have our first chemical reaction takes place, okay? This internal A, again, this picture doesn't show it very well. I'll show a better version that illustrates these parts on another picture. But the internal A has a free 2 prime OH. So confirm that for yourself. In the middle of an RNA strand, the 3 prime OH is involved in binding to a phosphate. The 5 prime OH is involved in binding to a phosphate. The 1 prime OH is where the base is attached, so it's not available. The 4 prime OH is now the O in the ring of the ribose, so the only OH available on a ribose is on the 2 prime position in the middle of the chain. So this OH is most definitely the 2 prime OH, and it attacks the phosphate on the very end of the intron. So you know there's a phosphate bridging these two Gs at the 5' prime splice site. Remember what RNA looks like. Right? Between these two sugars, there's a phosphate. So between those two sugars where the Gs are attached is where this OH attacks that phosphate. Okay, so it attacks the phosphate, forming a new phosphodiester bond and freeing up the 3' prime OH on the end of this G. Okay, so the last G of the exon, that A, G, and blue up there, is now detached from the next G. And all it has now is a 3' prime OH. The phosphate's been pulled away. Okay, so that's our first transesterification. Why is it called transesterification? Because I went from one phosphoester to another. This is virtually free energetically because I'm making and breaking very similar bonds. So the next thing to do is we do some slightly rearrangement of these U2s, U5s, and U6s, right? And it pulls the 5 prime free OH at the very end of this exon now, the 3 prime OH on this ribose of this G is now free. That's shown right here in the picture. And the rest of this, all these purines, or sorry, all these pyrimidines that were up here next between the A and the 3 prime end is kind of like pulling in the, the rope or pulling in the fishing line, right? It pulls this 3 prime end into the U5, U2 gap, okay? Lines it up with U6 once again, and this second as transesterification takes place, this free 3 prime OH can attack the phosphate again between the Gs, right? These two Gs on the 3 prime end this time. And when it attacks the phosphate, again, it makes a bond to that, freeing up this G, the last G of the AG on the intron, to leave with its phosphate. Or sorry, to leave without its phosphate, to leave with its 3 prime OH. Okay, so now I've connected this G in blue, the last base of the first exon, to the first G in green, the first base of the second exon, 
by one phosphate. And that's my spliced exons. Right? And that's free to go, and it's, it can run off and, and be an mRNA at the ribosome. What piece is left over? Well, that internal A is still attached to this G on the 5' end. It's also attached to the base that was before it and after it. So it is the only base in the entire strand that's attached to three other bases. That's a branch site. Most bases, except for the extremes, are only attached to two, the one before and the one after it. This A is now attached to three bases, so that's shown here. The one before and after it, and the G it was just recently attached to. And we show that in a different picture. You can watch the videos at the bottom. Both of those explain this as well. But let me show it in a different picture. So here's some pictures showing the similar things. Now let's look at the one on the right first. It's the exact same thing, just you're on a different point of view. So here we have our linear piece again. And I'm leaving out all the U's here in this photo. The U's are just cluttering up the image from what I want to show here. So in this one, it says the 2 prime OH of the internal A is attacking the phosphate here between these two G's, right? The last G here and the first G of the GU here, right? It's attacking that phosphate. When it attacks the phosphate, it's making a new connection, right? This A is still connected to the one before it and the one after it. This is a third connection now, okay? So you notice after we're done, we free up the OH on the three prime end. That's this G's ribosis OH. And now we have our A attached still to the one before and after it, but it's also attached through a phosphate to the G that was at the beginning of the intron. So I have this little lariat or loop, right, or lasso, right? And then we move some things around by the, the SNRPs or the U's rearranging themselves. And this 3 prime OH gets in proximity to the phosphate at the end of the exon or into the intron, bridging the next exon. We do yet another attack freeing up this piece to leave as the lariat. And I've put the pieces together. All right. The same thing is shown in a different way, different point of view, and the three panels on the left. Um, this one might seem a little more confusing, but once you see what parts are where, it makes sense. So shown here in red are the exons, and the intron is in green. So this red G right, is the last base of the exon, the first exon. This is its 2 prime OH, which we're not doing anything with. Then it's attached to a phosphate through its 3 prime OH, then attached to the green G through its 5 prime end. The 2 prime OH is still there, it has a G on it, and then we have our phosphate to the next base, which in this case is a U, and so on down the green chain. Eventually we come to that middle A, which is shown here at the top of the figure. It has a blue 2 prime OH, as all of them have a 2 prime OH, and it's connected onto the rest of the chain, eventually to the end of the intron A, G, followed by the A, usually a G, but it's shown as an A here, as the first base of the next exon. All right. So what's happening is the blue OH, the 2 prime OH of the A, attacks the phosphate that bridges the gap between exon and intron. Right? And once it does that attack, it is now attached at its 2 prime position to that G. Right? So to this green G. And that's in the next panel you'll see this A is attached 2 prime to the G. So this A is attached to three other nucleotides, the one before it, the one after it, and the G, just like we saw over here. Okay. You notice the 2 prime OH of this G is still there, and its 3 prime is now free. It's not attached to a phosphate anymore. Now the blue OH for the second nucleophilic attack can reach over and attack the phosphate at the intron second exon gap, just like we did before. Well, that's going to break this bond. This phosphate will be intervening between these two now, and this G is free to go with the lariat, and it's the excised intron. Okay, and I've connected them again. Okay. Okay. So when we do this, we have a very unusual bond we just created. This normal bonds between nucle nucleotides in a, a nucleic acid strand are between the 5' prime and the 3' prime OHs, with a phosphate in, the, in between the two. Here we have an unusual 2' prime to 5' prime with a phosphate between them, or phosphodiester bond. So it's very unusual. It doesn't occur normally. This is only in splicing. You see this. Okay. Right. One last way of looking at it, and this picture focuses less on the RNA and more on the, uh, sorry, less on the mRNA and more on the small nuclear RNAs, or the SNRPs, or these U's that actually do the rearranging for me. Okay. So 
Again at the top, I'm sorry for the color change, but this is the colors they chose in their figure. I'm looking at the, the boxes are the exons, the, the white box being the first exon, the colored dark box, you know, completely colored in, is the second exon or the next exon. And the non-box or just a line piece represents the intron with the branch site labeled. Okay. So again, the first two events are U1 recognizes the exon intron gap, the 5 prime n. U2 recognizes the branch site A and binds to it. Right? And we have our four, five, six donut. You notice it's all together showing up. We'll get how we got that at the end of this slide. And it, you know, those two come together. Now here's a little deceiving in this picture. It shows U1 binding U2. We know that doesn't happen. So again, this picture is great for showing some associations and terrible for others. So you gotta put all these pictures together. They're all lacking something. So here, U1 would bind to one side of the donut, U2 binding to the other. And we said U1 hands the five prime end to U5 and leaves. U4, the lens cap, comes off of U6 and leaves. And now we're at this position at the bottom. Don't worry too much about the NTC. That's a, the 19 complex. It's a bunch of proteins that come together to help this out. We're going to focus on the RNAs, not the protein. Okay, so we have U5, U6, and U2 all together holding these things. U5 is holding that 5 prime N. U2 is holding the internal A. U6 is acting as a scaffold or a platform for all this to line up. We have that first transesterification where the A's 2 prime attacks the 5 prime's phosphate. All right, and that makes the little lariat loop. That will free up the 3 prime end of the white box. We have some rearrangements where the proteins help this out. And it gets near the 3 prime end, the, the beginning of the black box there. And it does the second transesterification where the 3 prime OH can attack the phosphate between the intron and the next exon, and we can put the two together and make our mature exon-exon fused mRNA, and the lariat is free to go. Well, we need to recycle this stuff now, so the whole thing falls apart. The little lariat over here may or may not be useful. Often it's degraded. Sometimes it's used for other things. We won't discuss those. But the U5, U6, U2, and all those 19 complex proteins all come apart. Everything falls apart. The next thing to happen is U2 is free to go do its job again. U1 has been released a long time ago. As soon as U6 is released, U4 will bind it again because they're complementary. But U6 cannot associate with U5 until U4 covers it up. So U5 is recognizing the U6, U4 double helix. Okay, so here's why that's important. U4 is covering up U6, the platform. If U6 were exposed, it could do some random cutting events, right? It could line things up inappropriately and do some, not necessarily splicing, but perhaps splicing, but it could do some cleavage events on RNA, which would be bad. We don't want to randomly start cutting up our RNA. So let's keep the lens cap on it, U4, until we want it exposed. Okay? U6 can't really do a lot of the cutting unless U5 is there to help it with the chemistry. So it's convenient that U5 cannot bind to U6, unless 4 is already on there. And I'll use an analogy we came up with with one of you right before class, which was a very good question, is let's pretend U6 is a camera, right? an old-fashioned camera, not necessarily one of your phones, but it could be your phone. But let's say U6 is a camera. And me, I designed the camera, right? but I don't know how to use it. But I give it to you, and you know how to use it. Okay, So if U6 is the camera, and I give it to you, right? You are U5, you know how to use it. But we have this weird scenario, and I love making up weird analogies, that I can never hand you a camera without a lens cap on it. Right? So me being the, the inventor of the camera, I, I make the U6, and I put a U4 on it. And then I hand it to you. I hand you this U4, U6 complex, U being U5. I can never hand you 6 without its lens cap. Not allowed. But if I hand it to you, you obviously can't take a photo with it yet because it has a lens cap on it. And you're not allowed to take the lens cap off until you find something you want to take a picture of. And that's the presence of U1 and U2. Then your lens cap can come off. And you, as long as you have that U2, U5, U6 combination with the RNA in the middle, you can take your picture or line up these reactions. But once all that falls apart and U5 and 6 can't bind to one another anymore, in other words, you drop the camera, Right, when it all falls apart at the end, you can't pick it back up 
Why not? Because it doesn't have a lens cap on it. You're not allowed to pick it up without a lens cap. So I have to come along as the, the manufacturer and put the lens cap back on it and hand it to you again as the U4, U6 combo. What's the point of all this? It protects the cell from U6's activity because it will only allow it to work if it's in the context of the thing you intend to splice. So your camera can't take pictures by itself, just like U6 can't work by itself. It needs the operator, U or U5, right? But it won't work with the lens cap on either. Hopefully that analogy makes sense. We just came up with it like an hour ago. So it probably needs some refinement, but thank you for the question before class. And that's how these analogies start. Okay. All right, one last thing to look at is you remember I had this alignment of, uh, I said U6 works as a scaffold or a platform for all these alignments. So if you look at all these U6s from all these organisms, so if you go down the list here, these are all eukaryotes, of course, because prokaryotes do not do this. They do not splice their RNA. So all these are eukaryotes. So we have humans at the top, a mouse, a fly, a worm, a plant, tomato plant, and then all these pairings of letters are a bunch of yeast cells, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae and so forth. So these are all yeast, but they're eukaryotic cells. If we compare all the U6 sequences across the board, you notice that they match up fairly well in some regions. We agree with each other, but in some regions it's quite diverse. Like the five prime terminus of it doesn't really match well. Now it does match fairly well if you look more closely, like humans and mice match almost identically, but a fly is pretty close as well, not that far off from us. But then you go to yeast or plants, it's quite different because they've diverged quite a bit farther back in evolution. But if you look at the central domains, right, and the U4 interaction domain, this is where the lens cap would bind. That's the U4 binding region. We all use the same lens caps. They're almost identical lens caps. There's very few differences, right? And this other part, this IBP here in green, is where it interacts with the mRNA to do the splicing. So we all pretty much do it the same way. But the extremities are different. So a U6 in a human might work in a mouse, but it certainly wouldn't work in a tomato. Because these five prime and three prime termini determine which mRNAs it will interact with. It's not just the basic pieces I told you about. I told you how the inner machinery works. Like, and, uh, to use another analogy, I just described how, let's say, an internal combustion engine in a car works. Well, they all work the same way. They all have a combustion chamber, they all have a piston, they all have a spark that goes off, except in diesel engines. But they all work the same way. But could you tell what kind of vehicle it is? No, you need to zoom out. And if it's a truck or a car, if it's red, if it's a Ferrari, you really got to zoom out to see the whole thing. But internally, they all work the same way. That's how these U's work. The chemistry is always the same, but they don't always work the same on the same piece of mRNA. So they might be specialized to the genes for this particular pathway or the genes for this other pathway. Okay, one last thing with splicing, and I mentioned this earlier, if we start with a long piece of pre-mRNA, so shown here with a bunch of exons that are colored, and the introns here are in white. Okay, so all the introns are in white here, and all the colored pieces are exons. So this thing has six exons in this example, and necessarily five introns. How many ways can I splice this together? Well, let's, when you're given a problem like that, and you're asked how many ways to do something, always look at extremes. Start with, start with a small example. If I only had two exons and there was one intron, how many ways could I splice it together? One. I remove the intron. That's it. That's the only thing I can do. Let's go up a scale. What if I had two introns and, of course, three exons? Well, I could remove the two introns and put all the exons together. That's entirely possible. Or I could remove the two introns as a single intron and take that middle exon with it. That's entirely possible. And only the first and last exons get put together. So I'd lose the middle piece. And that's an alternative splicing combination. So again, I have two possibilities now. And for every time I add a new intron, the number of possibilities doubles. So if I add a third intron, I now have four possibilities. If I had a, a fourth intron, it goes up to eight and so forth. So I count the number of introns and I take two to that power because it doubles every intron. It's how many possible messages I could make. 
Okay? The very beginning, the first exon, and the very end, the last exon are almost always included, of course. But I may include one or more of the intermediate exons, or all of them, right? or none of them. All those are options. So in this case, we have five white introns. So there's two to the fifth, or 32 possible mRNAs I can make from this. Okay? What advantages does this have and what disadvantages does this have? So this alternative splicing right, is useful for cells from the same DNA. I could make 32 different proteins. The same stretch of DNA would make the same pre-mRNA, and I can splice it 32 different ways. Of course, that's how many possibilities there are. We're not going to explore the entire realm, so it probably only makes a couple of them. In fact, this one only makes two. Right? So the same piece of DNA codes for this pre-mRNA before splicing, and depending on what type of cell you're in, you will make a different subset of those U's. Remember, they differ a little bit. And they're going to determine which pieces get spliced. So in a neuron, or in a nerve cell, certain subset of U's will splice it the way you see it. Right? So it looks like it cuts out all the blues on the end and only splices together the beginning. Whereas in the thyroid cells, it completely cuts out that middle pink piece and puts the rest back together. Again, one of the 32 possible ways of doing this. But in those two proteins, you see they've retained the beginning part, those little uh, like amber-colored regions, right? but they have different other parts, either the pink or the blue. So they may have a, a let's say it's a, a calcium-binding region from the amber parts at the beginning, or amber-orange, or whatever color that shows on your screen. right? And at the beginning, or at the end of it, might be a different DNA binding region, or a different enzyme, or something else. Right, so the same DNA, the same mRNA precursor could make two totally different proteins. That's an advantage. I could make 32 different proteins here. How is this a disadvantage? Well, it takes time. Right? In order to splice this RNA, I can't immediately send it out for translation. So this is a longer process in time than prokaryotes do it. But we have the advantage of diversity, protein diversity through alternative splicing. Now, the king of alternative splicing would be antibody production, or queen, if you want to use queen of antibody production, right? This is an extreme example of alternative splicing. So the example on your screen lists five introns, which for antibody production, that's irrelevant. There's about 70 introns, right, for antibody production. So how many possible combinations could we make? Well, two to the 70th power, which is a ridiculously large number, right? It's in the trillions of trillions, right? So how is that possible? We have so many introns there that it basically puts them together randomly, right? The U's aren't so selective. They put them together randomly. Some parts are a little more selective, but the very end of the antibody, you guys remember what antibodies look like, the immunoglobulins with the little Y-shaped and the heavy chain, light chain. At the very tip of it, the protein sequence that's coded could virtually be anything. It's because we have all this random splicing that can happen. And so when you're trying to make an antibody to something, the cell tries it all. Make a lot of them. In fact, each cell tries a different one is how it works. And so one of them will actually work, and when it binds, we'll select you to make more. So that's how your antibody production is made on an extreme scale. So they are the extremes of alternative splicing. All right, don't confuse antibody here with antibiotic, which is a very common misconception. Antibodies are proteins, right? They're these immunoglobulins that you make with this very diverse splicing at the end of it, right? Whereas antibiotics are drugs. There are human-made ones. There are some naturally occurring ones, too, by fungi that kill bacteria. But those are drugs that kill organisms. Antibodies are proteins as part of the immune system. Don't confuse the two. Right, so here's an example of how the, the, a mutation in an intron could be bad. So step back a second, let me ask you a question. If you had to get a mutation, if you were told you must have a mutation, would you rather it occur in an intron or an exon? Intron. Why? Because the, the genetic material that's coded is mainly found in exon. So yeah, if, if I change an exon, we haven't covered the, the degeneracy of the genetic code yet, but if I, if I change an exon, I might change an amino acid, right? 
I might get a different amino acid put in at that point. That's totally possible. But you're thinking, and an intron is going to get removed anyway. So why does it matter? Well, it does matter. It depends where in the intron you get the mutation. So remember, at the very top here, let's look at our normal pre-mRNA. The blue here represents our exons again, and the white with the text in it represents the introns. So at the beginning, we have our GU. At the end, we have our AG, and that's what you see here for two introns we're removing. right? GU to AG, and then GU to AG gets removed. And it says in-frame stop codon, but from, from our point of view right now, it's not a stop codon. It's just part of the intron. It happens to have the same sequence as a stop codon, but it's going to get removed, so we ignore it, right? So ignore the word stop there for a second. But in the middle of this thing, we have an A, right? Maybe that's our internal A. And if we splice this out, we get our normal blue pieces put back together. There's our mature mRNA, which will make a mature protein, and everybody's happy. But what if you make a mutation in your intron? Maybe we turn that A into a G, okay? What might happen is our U1, all it's looking for is a GU, right? right? Usually following a G at the end of the exon, but a lot of our stop codons could be close to that, right? So AUG is a, is a start codon, but if you have a, a stop codon out of frame right next to it, we could have a G here. And then we have GGU. So U1 says, hey, I found this, I found the five prime splice site, it's right here. It's in reality should be over here, but it finds this one. So all we splice out is this piece here, leaving what should have been spliced out in the normal message. And because it was an in-frame stop codon, when this goes out to the ribosome to be made, it starts making it, and this is all nonsense at this point because it's not supposed to be there, but it stops here. It will not make the mature protein, and that's a useless product, and it gets degraded. So it goes and tries to make more, and it keeps recognizing this erroneous 5' prime splice site because of this mutation in an intron. It could have happened in an exon. You're absolutely right. That was easy to see. It could change the sequence as well. But don't think an intron is safe from mutations, right? All these diseases you see at the bottom of this table are for a resultant from mutations in the intron. So the U's, U1 or U2, makes a mistake in where it should bind, all because of these mutations. You notice we have hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, and uh, frontal temporal dementia, spinal atrophy, lots of things in here that result from an intron mutation, not an exon. And if you remember back to King George at the beginning, we said he had this, this disease where you couldn't degrade his heme group from hemoglobin, and that's the first one in the list here. That's the acute intermittent porphyria. So porphyrias are where you don't degrade the heme, and you're left with all these polyporphyrins in the, in the intermediates in the pathway and they can build up or cause problems. And, uh, we don't know exactly which enzyme was his issue, but one of them was causing this problem, right? And it's a, it's a, there's like eight genes involved there in degrading heme. So that is definitely a mutation in an intron where he never splices it correctly to get the mature enzyme he needs to degrade that heme group, right? About 15% of all genetic diseases known are because the mutation is in an intron, not an exon. And so don't think it's totally safe. I still agree with you. I would rather it in an intron than an exon because it's less likely to land in an important spot. But it still can cause problems. Okay. And the last thing I want to mention today for this lecture is if you have a piece of RNA and you want to splice it, we needed all these U's to help us out and some protein accessories to help those work more efficiently. But in fact, you don't need any of those things. And depending on the sequence of RNA, it can splice itself. Okay, so this was discovered in the 80s by uh, Thomas Check and Sidney Altman, who won the Nobel Prize in 1989 for this. They had a piece of RNA inside this little protozoan called tetrahymena, and it would make this RNA, right, shown at the top. Here's, it's got a, a blue piece and a, an intervening intron in red and then a yellow uh, exon that occurs after the blue one. And every time they would try to purify this RNA, right, you, you take the RNA out of the cell, you can extract RNA from cells, try to purify it, and they're expecting the length of the thing to be the blue plus the red plus the yellow in length. And every time they had it purified, it'd always be just the length of the blue and yellow, like something spliced out the red piece. And of course, the, the first thing you do, and I'm, I'm not really picking on you guys, but it's, it's a common thing, is 
Uh, was this performed by an undergrad? Yeah, they probably messed up. Well, that's how you learn. Of course you're going to mess up the first time you do something. That's how you learn from something. So I'm not picking on you. That's how you, you learn from your mistakes. So, of course, let's put someone else who's a little more experienced on it to pure this, purify this RNA. And then you excise out the piece and you still got the spliced exons. So maybe there's something in the solution who we haven't, we haven't removed it. There's still some U's around or there's some protein around that's doing this. Let's get rid of it, purify it really well. And every time, no matter who did it, you would always get the spliced exons. So is it splicing itself? How can you test this? So the way they tested it is they synthesized the RNA outside of the cell completely, you know, in a, in a test tube. You put one base on and then the next, one base, then the next, next base, next base. Just synthesize it as a, as a, a chemistry experiment. And when they got the whole thing synthesized, it spliced itself in a test tube. It's not from a biological origin at all. It spliced itself. All it needed was a free guanine around, right? Guanine with its ribose, guanosine with its ribose and OH. Well, while you're synthesizing it, of course that's around. That's one of the four components. So it synthesized itself or it spliced itself out. So it folds on itself in such a way that the G does the role of U6, right? This guanine does the role of U6 and sort of the role of the internal A at the same time, right? And a picture at the bottom is how it does this. It folds on itself highly and it splices its own piece out, right? So these are called ribozymes and it was proof that you finally had an RNA molecule that could act as an enzyme. And that's what they got the Nobel Prize for, for showing concrete proof that RNA in the absence of protein can act as an enzyme. And we've seen many of these do this. The ribosome is the biggest example. Right? There's many more, like your RNA's P that does part of your trimming we talked about earlier.